you already know the Brisbane climate, so you can probably guesstimate what you need to do, but you've been seconded somewhere else and you, don't, you haven't lived there for more than a month, so you don't know what the climate's doing. So what you want to do is get climate data and have a look at that. And we're going to use the example of Brisbane because we know what that looks like. So in the last um, slide of the, the last section, we saw this very complicated psychometric chart, which um, is super confusing and we don't really need that level of complexity. So we're going to look at this one, which is simply uh, on, the, on the bottom axis, we've got temperature. So on the right hand side, it's hotter and on the vertical axis we've got humidity. So we end up with four quadrants, right? So the, the top right is hot and humid, uh, the bottom right is hot but dry, and on the left hand side down the bottom it's dry and cold, and the top left is uh, humid and cold. So four quadrants, um, and the, the picture we're seeing now is Brisbane, and the colours are uh, the predicted mean vote, which is a way of, a mathematical way of working out what people will feel in terms of comfort based on the humidity and the temperature. So when it's green, it's good. Green's good. Red um, means that it's going to be too hot, and all those blue dots mean that it's going to be too cold. So what we can see in Brisbane, there's about 8,000 dots on this page representing each hour of the year the bulk of those dots are green. So Brisbane's a great place to do mixed mode because even outside is pretty comfy. But um, there are those red dots on the right hand side and that's what people think about when they think about Brisbane, those really stinking hot periods. Um, and you can see they're actually quite humid. They're getting up towards the top of the chart as well. And then we've also got a few cold dots over on the left hand side. So you need to think about those, particularly in winter for the winter warm up. Maybe it's only two to three hours, but it does get cold on those winter days. So um, let's have a look at some other climates where you might work around the world. Um, this first one here we can see is pretty cool. Um, and there's no, there's no uh, red dots at all, which means that it never gets too hot. So this climate is in Denmark, so it's a typical kind of European climate where they often might not even have air conditioning in some of their buildings, but they, they have a lot of heating. So all that heating is on the left hand side there, all those dots at the, on the left hand side. It's usually humid when it's cold for certain reasons, but um, that kind of climate, you're gonna have a completely different response in your building um, because you might not even need to air condition. And in winter, it's, all, it's going to be about getting solar gain into your building. And so for that kind of climate, your windows aren't going to need to be so big. You're really looking at trying to keep the heat in, um, potentially using a heat exchange ventilator to keep that heat in, but get fresh air in at the same time. Okay, the next, um, next climate is a trick because it's Brisbane again. So um, you can see if you compare that to the former one, how, how much of a Goldilocks kind of climate is called we have. But it's not always the case in Australia because this next one we can see um, looks like it's going to go off the chart. And if you think about where in Australia this might be, we've got a lot of humidity. It's going up really high on, the, on that vertical axis and it's also really hot and it's almost never cold. It's never in those left two quadrants. Um, so in terms of capital cities, this is Darwin and uh, your the design response is going to be all about dealing with that humidity and you know all those red dots are going to be really hard to deal with unless you've got good air conditioning. It's not to say it's impossible, but um, the default response, and you'll see this in Darwin, is just to turn the air con on. Um, the final one here is, a, is an interesting climate. It's where I grew up, it's Melbourne, and it's got a much wider range of temperatures than the other climates we've seen. So in a sense, it's a more interesting climate to design for because we've got a lot of these cold hours on the left-hand side, so it does get pretty cold in Melbourne. Uh, we've got a few Goldilocks hours in the middle, that's the, your spring and autumn, where you can have the windows open. And on the right-hand side, unlike the tropics that we saw in, in Darwin, we've got these dry, hot 
hours. So when it's dry and hot, air movement is really effective and evaporative cooling is effective too. But the, the point being that there's different responses and just from looking at a single chart, you can begin thinking about what your design response is gonna be and whether mixed mode's gonna work. If you've got a lot of green dots, you're probably good to go. If it's all red or all blue, maybe think again or um, at least lower the expectations of the number of hours that you're gonna be able to open the building. Okay, so what, um, what can we do to increase those number of green dots? That, that's really what we're all about. You can't change the outside temperature or the humidity, but you can change people's comfort. And probably the easiest way to do that is just to put in a ceiling fan. So in this next slide, if we add in the ceiling fan, then we can see that those green dots, again in theory, extend out and they nearly cover all of those red dots and we just have those that kind of core of, of red dots which are still too hot even if you had air movement. So a really good starting point if you do have mixed mode and it is too hot is to put in ceiling fans um, and to get and or to get air movement. So you can get air movement through opening your windows um, which you need to do to evacuate the heat that's built up but it's a little bit unreliable in the sense that it's not always windy. Which is a great segue to talking about wind. So um, there's going to be a, a case study which you guys will be doing about uh, a particular building and particularly when you're looking at retrofitting, you don't really have a lot of choice and often because of design constraints, you don't choose where your facades are. So you've got an east facade and you've got a north facade, let's say. Um, what, you can, what you can choose in terms of picking up the wind, because you want the wind to flow through to, to flush out all the heat, you can choose where the windows are and how they open. They can open left or right if they're casements. Awnings can open down so you don't get much in. So first thing is to look at wind roses, which are really easily accessible on the Bureau of Meteorology site. Um, but take them with a grain of salt because on the left hand side here, those two wind roses show the year round um, wind, whereas, oh sorry, the, the, the left hand side shows what we actually want, which is what the wind looks like when it's hot. But if you compare that to some of the other wind roses, which are for the same location, those are the year round wind roses, which is what you get from the bomb. So think about what or when you want the wind and there's various tools you can use to work out where the wind's coming from when you want it to be windy. So in our case, in Brisbane, we want to know, and um, the wind rose here shows that, we want to know where the wind's coming from when it's about above 24 degrees because when it's below 24 degrees, we're probably going to have our windows shut. And you can see between the differences of these wind roses that rather than having all the uh, windows on the, the north or the south, you might actually put them directed to catch that wind which is coming from the east. So this is going to depend on the location and it's going to also depend on the surrounding buildings. Um, but it does make a big difference and particularly if you put in um, louvers which are fully openable compared to awning windows which tend to only have a small opening um, and you have a lot of facade doesn't work for really deep buildings but if you have a lot of facade sitting near a window which you can operate is a really uh, you know people really enjoy having that operation but you need to have air coming through it so let's look at um, how that might work because it's not as easy as putting everyone on a corner. This is a, a project down in Manly I did a number of years ago and common to a lot of projects they've got the private offices on the facades because that's where the the big wigs sit and they get all the access to the facade and then in the middle we've got the um, the people that work in the cubicles, the uh, the, um, the open plan offices which unfortunately don't have a lot of access to the facade and this is a really common problem so if you've got a mixed mode building you need to rethink the traditional layout uh, and that often is quite hard because of the client requirements. 
Um, so in this case, we went some way to alleviating it. So in, in the middle here with those four desks, we've got the, the majority of the staff that need to be kept cool and want to have access to the facade and to breezes. So on the, on the west and the east, they've got access to the facade. Um, but on the north and south, they don't. So that was the best we could do in this situation um, because those offices to the north block out wind coming from the north. And we did a post-occupancy study as part of another research project and we found exactly what we expected, which was in the middle, those two desks in the middle, people are really uncomfortable. So what happened is that those people were the loudest uh, because they were the most uncomfortable. So they said, we need to close this building down and turn on the aircon. So um, just having, you know, 30% of the people uncomfortable, you need to try to satisfy everyone. And those 30% of people were uncomfortable, so they closed down the building. So it didn't operate in, in open mode um, as much as it could have. All right, so um, that's where we're headed in, in terms of climate. Understand the climate first, understand the wind, um, understand a bit about where the occupants are going to be sitting and what they're going to be doing. Um, but before we kind of um, crack into designing a facade, let's just understand a bit about how we do it normally. So when I say normally, it's aircon. So this uh, little diagram shows an aircon system, which you may have seen before, but to recap, on the left-hand side, we've got a whole lot of plant in a commercial building. It's nearly always on the roof, and they're condensers which expel the hot air, uh, which is come from the building. In the plant room, there's a chiller or a heat pump, essentially the same thing, which um, creates coolness by rejecting heat up to the roof to those cooling towers or to the condensers. And once we've got that coolness, which is in the form of a cool fluid, a, a cool refrigerant gas that's just turned into a liquid, it's about six degrees, we need to get it to the occupants somehow. So this then leads to all the stuff you need to coordinate in the building. So you've got a cool fluid, you can put it through pipes with lots of copper, you can blow air over it. So now you've got cold, cold air, which is a good start. You've got to get the air to the occupants, so you have big ducts. Um, typically for you know, the, the buildings you'll see in the city, they might be one, even two metres in diameter to get that volume of air down. So that's a big impact on your floor plate that you need to plan for. They'll, then they'll go into each floor, branch off into a whole lot of smaller ducts, a bit like a, you know, your lungs or circulatory system, and eventually get into diffusers which blow that air down onto you at about 12 degrees, gradually heats up with all the loads, goes back up into another set of return air ducts at about 24 degrees, and most of that air is then recirculated so this leads to the, if you don't have enough fresh air coming in, leads to the sick building syndrome where pollutants build up, um, someone's got a cough, everyone gets sick, all this kind of stuff. Um, so to avoid that, we put in more fresh air, um, but the more fresh air you put in, the higher the energy cost. So most buildings will have the code minimum fresh air requirements. Um, and you know, there's, there's a balance there's a balance there and if you can avoid having as much uh, heat load in the space, uh, you can have a smaller air conditioner. So when you're looking at mixed mode buildings, it's, it's a bit of a win-win in a sense. In one sense, you've got complexity because you've got two systems, but in another sense, if you make the effort to have a well-designed passive building which works well when it's naturally ventilated, it's shaded, it's got openings, etc. That's going to mean you can put in a smaller air conditioner uh, because even in summer when the building's closed up, you've got good shading and good glazing which can reduce the size of your air conditioner so you can offset some of that additional cost. Um, before we get into the next section, let's just um, check out what some of this air conditioning gear looks like because remember mixed mode does have air conditioning as well. 
Um, all these words on the left hand side are really good to use because you're going to be talking to mechanical consultants or building services consultants. They're going to say them without even thinking about it um, and it's good to know what they mean. So let's have a look. A split system is simply having an air conditioner on the wall and the main system outside because in the old days they just used to bolt them together and put them through the wall. So when talk of, people talk about splits, it's usually domestic style air conditioner. Flex is something that everyone hates. It's the flexible ducts that goes in the ceiling, which means that you have to make space in your design to fit these big flexible ducts into the space. Um, thermostats are really important and often in modern buildings, and I'm looking around this building, I can see they have this problem. There's no way to put them because there's no walls. There's only structure and glass. So there needs to be a place to put thermostats. And for mixed mode building, that's really important because depending on what that thermostat's saying to the control system, that may or may not open um, the window. So it's got to be representative of the, the space condition. Um, there's diffusers which um, let out the air and um, they need to be integrated in, usually into a tiled ceiling in a commercial environment but you can also have exposed diffusers and exposed ducts. Spiral duct which is often exposed, often in retail situations, people think it's trendy, looks cool. Uh, we've actually got some here up above me. And uh, rather than having that ceiling closed off, you can have this exposed duct, which um, can be, from an aesthetic point of view, can be preferable. And finally, a cassette unit is um, the lowest of the low when it comes to air conditioning. If you want to put in a, a cheap, nasty system into a shop, you put in a cassette. Um, they work pretty well and you're almost certain that there's no fresh air coming into that shop because they can't handle any fresh air. So when you see a cassette, be wary of um, not having enough ventilation. And finally, condensers, something that take up a lot of space, have to go outside because they reject uh, hot air and usually always go on the roof. So if you're thinking for your case study building, we're going to have a green roof and it's going to be wonderful and going to have a pool and whatnot. You can do that, but you need a place to put the plant. There needs to be um, space to put these condensers or cooling towels which serve the same purpose. Okay, so in the next section, we're going to have a look in detail at facades.